Good afternoon, all. Thank you for joining us. As we get started, all of us at Ivy would like to recognize the history and the tradition of the lands on which Western University Ivy Business School and our own Spencer Leadership Center are located today. We acknowledge and respect the traditional lands of the peoples where Western resides. Connected with the London Township, Sombra Treaties of 1796, as well as the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wapum, this land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land, vital contributors of our own academic community. We commit to renewing and building on our relationships with Indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. And since we're virtual today, we, we'd also invite all of you to think about the land you share and add your acknowledgments in the chat. For those of you who join us regularly for our live stream series, I welcome back. If you're new to all of this, then welcome. We host this series for business leaders and people leaders in our community looking for perspectives and, you know, it's, it's become not just a, a tricky time, a long and tricky time. Bonjour et bienvenue. Si vous avez nous joined pour nos autres webinaires, merci. Si c'est votre première fois, très bien. On espère que vous trouvez la valeur aujourd'hui. I'm Mark Healy. I'm the Executive Director of the Ivy Academy. That's the Learning and Development Wing of Ivy Business School in London. Je suis le chef d'éducation exécutif à l'École de commerce Ivy à l'Université de Western, c'est en Ontario. Well, um, the agriculture and agri-food system is a key driver of Canada's economy. In 2018, it generated uh, almost 8% of GDP, accounted for one in every eight jobs. Agriculture in Canada is also long established, uh, times traditional industry, currently experiencing some pretty deep disruption. From automation to alternative proteins, the ecosystem's changing quite rapidly. You know, in another life, I'm, I'm actually learning a lot about ag and food in Canada, and I, I'm excited about the topic today. I already learned a ton in our prep session, uh, and I know I'm going to learn a lot more today from our guests. We're, we're really lucky. Today, we have with us uh, Ryan Reese, HBA 09, MBA 15. He's the National Director of Agriculture at RBC. We also have Jessica Kelly, HBA 09 entrepreneur, hog farmer, in fact, and lecturer at Ivy Business School with us. And we're going to uh, run things a little differently uh, today. Ivy's own uh, Mazzy Raz is with us today as a co-host. So Mazzy and I go back a long time. We did our uh, MBA together uh, here at Ivy longer ago than probably either of us would like to admit. Uh, we worked together at the Academy. Mazzy's uh, assistant professor and director of learning design and strategy at the Academy. And today, our, our technical director is Tyler, uh, Tyler Hubbard's with us. He'll be playing the role of Sean Acklin Grant today. And uh, as always, you know, we'll take questions through the Q&A in the chat. A recording of this session will be posted later today, along with any follow-up that we, we sent out afterward. Uh, Tyler, did uh, just one note to you, did I miss anything uh, on the way through here? We're going to go with no, no on yeah, that. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, okay, so uh, Mazzy, over to you to get things started, please. Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, at the top, Mark, you, you gave us some very impressive statistics about um, the importance of Canadian agriculture and, and um, the food system uh, as it relates to the Canadian economy. You mentioned that uh, it, like in 2018, it generated about um, $140 billion and it accounts for about 7% of the GDP. Agriculture is one of the oldest, uh, arguably one of the oldest um, uh, industries and it's embedded in all aspects of our lives. Yet it's, it often remains in the background. We don't really think about the products that we consume, like things that we wear. I mean, this is an agricultural product and, and uh, what's on our plate on a daily basis. Um, it's certainly not something that it's on the top of the front of all the leaders um, at, at all times. So to set the stage and to get a little bit more understanding of the macro view of agriculture in the Canadian landscape, um, why don't we turn to our guest, uh, uh, first Jessica, and then, and then Ryan, uh, Jessica, can you please um, start sharing some, some background in your experience in this field and also help uh, with um, a, a macro view of uh, Canada's agri-system? Absolutely, thanks for having me. So in terms of my background in agri-food, uh, in 2015, my partner and I co-founded a farm business called Amani Farms Limited. And the focus of our business is specialty protein production. So we're part of supply chains that provide pork to retailers such as Whole Foods uh, or Wegmans, if you're familiar with that, that retailer in the United States. To give you a sense of scale, our annual sales are about $6 million and we employ um, about 15 full-time equivalent in terms of staff. We have operations and customers in both Canada and the United States and pork that originates on our farm ends up feeding people in North America as well as around the world. 
Um, again, in terms of scale, we produce 26,000 pigs per year approximately. And if you were to uh, do some rough calculations based on per capita pork consumption in Canada, that's roughly enough pigs to feed the city of Victoria, BC, uh, what they eat in terms of pork every year. Um, a whole other hat that I have worn in terms of my agra food experience is I've also worked in the public service as a business advisor to the direct farm marketing sector in Ontario. So when we say direct farm marketing, that's any farm business that sells direct to their consumer. So that could be from a farm gate uh, at a farmer's market through online sales, through agritourism, that type of thing. And actually just skimming the participant list, I think we actually have a few folks that um, are entrepreneurs in that sector joining us today, which is fabulous. Um, in terms of the macro view, um, certainly the economic driver and employer um, employment stats that were shared, I think, is something that often gets overlooked about our industry. People don't necessarily realize the magnitude of it. I think for me, a couple other key macro themes are around, um, one would be around the diversity of the industry. Um, and so that I mean, in terms of like the length of the marketing chain is one place where we have diversity. So we have the contrast of my farm that has this sort of long and convoluted supply chain from farm gate to consumer. And then we have farms that grow strawberries and you walk onto their property and pick them yourself and take them home. So we have a huge diversity in terms of chains, in terms of products, um, even fruits and vegetables alone, we grow over 120 different uh, fruits and vegetables in Canada. And then also huge diversity in terms of scale. Um, in the most recent egg, uh, egg census, about seven and a half percent of farms had sales over $2 million. And those farms made up about 60% of all of the farm sales for the country. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, we have almost a third of farm businesses that have less than $25,000 in annual sales. So we have this massive range in terms of scale of business. For me, the other um, major theme is around like just this, the sheer resource, resource power and cost competitiveness advantages that we have to help us feed the world. Um, and my sector pigs is a prime example of that. We export about 70% of the pork that we produce. Um, for beef and cattle, um, it's about 50%. There's other crops like canola where it's upwards of 90% of the product that gets exported. So we certainly have a lot of powerhouse capacity that far exceeds the number of eaters that we have in this country. Oh, beautiful. And, and thank you. That's um, quite an impressive uh, experience that you have um, gained so far. And, and uh, the diversity of this agribusiness mix makes me really wonder about some of the challenges that um, we're, we're seeing in the future. We'll come back to that question uh, in a second. Let's hear from Tyler. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry from, from Ryan. Ryan, how about you? Uh, what is uh, um, your experience and, and what you see from a macro view about the Canadian agribusiness? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Reese. I'm the National Director of Agriculture with RBC. Um, in my role, I'm responsible for leading and, and driving the strategy for the bank, for the ag sector. Uh, so agriculture is what we consider a priority sector at RBC. It's an industry we are uh, heavily invested in and see a really promising future for. Uh, it's also an industry we recognize as being very important to our country's success, um, both today and, and even more so in the future, given the opportunity for Canada, uh, Jessica touched on. Uh, you know, to continue to play an increasingly important leadership role in feeding a growing global population that is, you know, demanding more of what uh, Canada produces. Um, you know, my role oversees both primary egg um, and agribusiness. So uh, primary egg, think of, you know, livestock, dairy, beef cattle, poultry, hogs, all the way through to, to field crops, or your grains and oil seeds, mixed crops, fruits and vegetables, greenhouses, kind of you name it. Uh, you know, RBC um, uh, serves those, those sectors. And for agribusiness, think of those companies that are, you know, one or two steps removed from the farm. Uh, my role entails different duties, but primarily centered on, on the goal of building a strong value proposition for our clients to consider RBC to be their financial partner. Uh, so as part of this, my responsibilities involve ensuring the right policies and products are in place that meet the needs of egg producers. Very unique business, obviously, uh, that our marketing is compelling and sending the right message. Uh, that we're working with the right industry partners to bring new solutions forward that we're uh, constant and, and most importantly that we're constantly listening to our clients somewhere we can improve. Um, another key part of my role is external facing, uh, participating in events like this, ag events, uh, PR opportunities, developing strong relationships and keeping a finger on the pulse of the sector so we're, we're quick and agile to react in order uh, to ensure our clients are well supported. 
uh, on a personal note, uh, I'm born and raised farm kid. Uh, grew up on a pig farm, uh, similar to Jessica. Uh, my dad had a swine genetics company for over 30 years, uh, specializing in a specific breed of animals that we, we sold to farms all around the world. Um, as a young boy and into my university years, um, every summer and weekend was spent working on the farm, uh, learning new skills, learning about how to run a business and, and make decisions and, and being proud of what we did uh, with each day uh, being a new experience, uh, mo mostly, mostly good ones. Um, my brothers and I came back to the farm after university at, at Ivy, uh, all started our careers in the family business. Uh, we, we joke that, you know, we, we clearly must not have given our dad a, a lot of confidence in, in our ability to take over the farm because he, he sold it a couple of years later. Um, however, I'll always, you know, cherish those years because it, it gave me firsthand experience in industry I've, I've now chosen to make my career. Um, after the sale of the business, I worked for uh, the company that acquired us named uh, Hendrix Genetics, uh, a multi-species genetics company out of the Netherlands for, for a couple of years, uh, helping to ensure a smooth transition of clients and employees. Uh, and then later went to work for another uh, couple of businesses, including Monsanto and Maple Leaf Foods uh, before heading back to Ivy uh, to do my MBA. Uh, after my MBA, I branched outside of agriculture for the first time and, and, and took a job in management consulting in Calgary where as you would guess it, the majority of the focus was on oil and gas. Um, but this, this time away for the industry, I think was very important for me uh, because the old saying, you don't know what you got till it's gone, I think really came to life. Um, sometimes you need to step away from something to see how much you appreciate it. And, and that was the case for me. I, I, I soon found out that agriculture was where I wanted to dedicate my career because of the, the potential and the opportunities and the purpose of the industry. Uh, and now I've spent the last three years uh, having the privilege of, of leading the egg sector for, for the largest bank in Canada. Equally impressive. Thank you. Uh, Ryan and Jessica, uh, last year was a special year for in, in every single industry, specifically as a result of COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, thinking ahead, what permanent changes do you anticipate seeing in the sector as a result of this pandemic? Ryan, let's start with you. Sure. Um, really good question. And, and you know, I, I think difficult to say if in itself uh, it will change anything long term or if it will accelerate changes that were you know, in the pipeline or have been percolating for, for some time. I think um, through this difficult period, Canadians have, have seen just how important agriculture is to, to our well-being. And then, when, you know, when the, when the world stopped, our, our farmers and other essential workers and, and all those along the food value chain, uh, kept going and, and continued to provide us with what we needed. Um, I believe our farmers probably uh, deserve more recognition than, than they get. Um, and through this period, I think that is changing and it's creating additional interest and curiosity in food and, and where it comes from. Um, I think the biggest thing um, we as an industry can do to build trust and engage a new audience in the industry is to pro proactively share um, with others um, you know, our experiences. Uh, like we're doing today. Uh, so the question of the impact of the pandemic and changes that may come from that, I think a lot of 2020 was, and, and, and into 2021 was about getting through it, uh, getting through this pandemic. Uh, as Canadians, our lives changed so much and it's been tough on everyone, in particular, obviously those who, who were impacted directly with, with a loved one getting sick or, or unfortunately passing. Um, as we're now in, in kind of almost the middle of 2021 already, uh, we continue to put one foot in front of the other each day and, and there are a few areas that I think we'll, we'll see added attention in the egg space. So, so first, um, and you, you, you spoke on it uh, at the beginning of, of your opening remarks, but uh, adoption of egg technology. Um, the past few years has been a whirlwind for digital solutions in, agri in the agriculture industry. Um, it is and continues to be the, the hot topic and, and there is no shortage of op options for, for farms to consider. Uh, you can't attend a conference or, or pick up uh, an egg publication without mention of egg tech. Um, the key, however, is, is the adoption of that and, and the farms choosing the right technology that fits um, the needs of their operation. Uh, and it really depends on where they are on that adoption curve. And, you know, to, to Jessica's point earlier as well, there's, there's a, a wide range in, in the size and, and scale of farms. So, you know, some may be more equipped with the infrastructure and the resources and the finances to do that. And uh, not to mention rural connectivity issues sometimes as well. Uh, one example of this is accelerated adoption of automation solutions um, in the coming years as a way to control more variables 
uh, given the impact of COVID-19 on, on borders and worker flows and on in-person processing uh, capacity, I think we see a strong incentive uh, to invest in, in these automated technologies. Um, for, for labor, I mean, I think a second trend in Canada um, is really about solving our labor challenge. Uh, the Canadian Human Resources Council uh, is projecting that over the next decade, we'll have 123,000 um, uh, jobs available for Canadians in the agriculture space. So a big gap we need to fill. Uh, prior to COVID, when I traveled extensively across the country visiting clients, I'd ask them, you know, what keeps you up at night? And, and often it was reliable labor for their operations. And the industry needs to do a better job attracting people in ag roles. And I think that's going to, uh, I think that's, you know, come to the surface and, and you know, certainly going forward, that's, it could be another impact. Um, and then lastly, um, I think planning, just in general planning going forward, whether that's business planning, risk management planning, succession planning, and I'll, I'll just touch on succession planning. Uh, you know, we've seen from the past year, it, it always pays to have a plan. Uh, the old saying, hope for the best and plan for the worst, um, I think is, is really true. And, and certainly after the year we've gone through, I think it, it, it really encourages the industry to sit down, put pen to paper and adopt this planning process as part of their business operation. Uh, given the mix of, of family and business and legacy and, and not to mention usually millions of dollars, often the path chosen um, is avoidance on, on how this is all going to transition to the next generation um, out of sensitivity or potential hurt feelings. But it's something that the, you know, the industry needs to do a better job of. Um, you know, again, we saw this year that lives and circumstances can change overnight and being able to have those strategies in place I think will allow everyone to move forward more confidently with, with peace of mind. Um, and, you know, too often in, in ag, we hear of heartbreaking stories of, of sudden passings or unforeseen events, and, and there is no succession plan in place. And, and now you have, you know, brothers and sisters and family members and, and spouses uh, fighting and, and relationships are broken and, and that wealth um, is not passed efficient, efficiently down, um, you know, other than other than to lawyers, unfortunately. So it, I think it's a good good time to for everyone to use this as an opportunity to, to plan better for the future too. Right. Uh, thank you, Ryan. I, I suspect some of these are um, some of the things that you mentioned are features of the agribusiness, and they've been uh, uh, they've been with us for some time. Uh, the inability to plan, for instance, um, and then some of them are, have been uh, um, um, brewing for some time. For instance, the uh, arrival of you mentioned agri-tech, a, ter a term that I had never heard before. I thank you for that. Uh, I was going to uh, run and ask for an example, but you gave us a good example about the automation part of it. But there are some features that are, there are some things that we anticipate e experiencing, permanent things that we can experience as a result of um, the pandemic. So Jessica, what are your points of views about these? Um, are, your, are yours similar to Ryan's? Yeah, I would agree with, with everything that, that Ryan shared. I think for me, the, the, the COVID pandemic, I think largely exposed vulnerabilities that we already knew were there. And I would say in the instances that have personally impacted our business, we knew they were there because we designed them to be there. So um, I guess I'll explain what I mean there. You know, Canadians are accustomed to very affordable food. You know, we spend only about 10 to 11% of our disposable income on food. Uh, contrast that to 23% in Mexico and 42% in Ukraine, to throw out two examples. So we're accustomed to very, very affordable food. And that feeds into this reality that our entire agri-food sector generally operates on pretty low margins. We're lean, we're mean, we're efficient. But also a lot of what we do is just in time in order to have that efficiency and get people the affordable food that they want when they want it. Um, so personally for, for our own business, there have been multiple periods over the last year where our major processor customers had challenges at their processing plants with COVID and their staff that required them to slow down their lines or shut them down entirely, which then obviously has huge impacts on the people that work in those plants, the business of the plant, but then that has all the way back the chain and all the way you know, up and back the chain in both directions, that has impacts um, in terms of logistics, in terms of revenue. Um, we're dealing with living creatures, whether it's, it's crops or whether it's livestock, we can't just tell the pigs to stop growing because we don't have a, a, another barn for them to go to. So it creates a lot of um, 
the challenge is there. So, you know, when I think about the permanent changes that I wonder about, I ask myself questions like, you know, will our processing facilities ever get back to full capacity? Because I, I don't, I don't think any of them are at their pre pandemic capacities, at least on a consistent basis. So I ask myself questions, you know, will we get back there? Or are we forever going to have to change those in key infrastructure pieces um, to change process to space people out? Uh, maybe it's implementing technologies as Ryan suggested. And do we as a society expect to have stockpiles of food products in case something catastrophic happens? Um, and I think as a society, it's fine for us to say, yes, those are things we want, but we also have to recognize that, that those things come at a cost. Stockpiles come at a cost. Slowing down processes and production systems has a cost, and we're not used to expensive food. Um, so those are just sort of some of the things I think about. Um, the other, one of the things that Ryan mentioned, I just want to latch on to, to emphasize its importance. And again, anyone who deals with awful rural internet didn't need a pandemic to tell them this was a problem, but I think it's the first time that anyone else has paid attention. And it is so important. And I hope that it gets the attention that it needs because it is such a major hurdle for our industry. The office I'm sitting in right now is an office that I pay to rent because I could not have functional internet at my farm that is actually good enough to run a business. So I pay to rent an office offsite because of that, okay? So um, that's something that I, I really, really hope is a long-term positive change that we see out of this for our industry because it's so important. Jessica, the doomsday preppers have been telling us for years and years and years we need to stockpile food, don't you think? Pardon me, Mark? The, the, the doomsday preppers have been telling us to stockpile food forever. So maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, they, had it, maybe they had it right all the way along. Uh, we, we wanna move this along and talk about kind of challenges and opportunities in the industry. A fair number of challenges already raised. Let's. Let's flip the script and look at, at kind of opportunities. I, I know when we, when we talked uh, before, we talked a bit about global trends that we thought we should be paying attention to. What can we sort of borrow and adopt here? And we also talked about kind of the unique role that Canada plays in the global landscape and some natural advantages we have. So Jessica, maybe start with you. What, what do you see as opportunities say for the coming, coming decade for the industry in Canada? For me, I think one of the, the, the most exciting opportunities in terms of trends is really around, um, you know, emerging crops, uh, things like pulses, alternative proteins, peas, lentils, um, because of the huge capacity we have to produce some of those products in Canada, and then the emerging export opportunities that, um, that exist because of that. Um, when I was pulling some, some stats together for today, one of the fascinating ones that I found was that over 50% of all of the lentils traded in the entire world come from Saskatchewan fields. Um, so I think for me, um, in terms of like emerging trends, um, that's probably the one of the things that's um, most exciting and one of the greatest opportunities um, for potential growth going forward. So that sound was uh, about 140, about 147 in the audience calling their broker saying get me get me lentils get me lentils that's what was, <laughs> that's what was happening what, what about you ryan how, how do you look at opportunities in canada you come at it from a pr probably a bit of a different perspective investment perspective macro perspective yeah yeah i mean i i think there's you know probably still more potential for for value add here here in canada meaning taking um, you know, some of those, those pulses or lentils that Jessica spoke of and, and, and kind of taking that extra step with them. So, um, you know, often in, in Canada, we do a really good job of taking that raw commodity uh, and, and selling it or shipping it simply as that and, and have someone else add that, that step in. And, and of course, it isn't as, as simple as that, um, you know, given our population and often it's, it's better to add that, that step or more efficient to add that step closer to the population consuming that final product, but uh, you know, give, given the logistics of it, but I, I believe we can do better there. And, and I think, um, you know, certainly it's a good way to add um, GDP. Um, we need to attract investment here in Canada as well. I think uh, we need to give confidence and assurance that, that Canada is, is a good place to do business and agribusiness and, and, and make it attractive for, for foreign direct investment. Um, I think a good example is the French company Roquette, uh, the pea plant being built in Manitoba, the largest, I believe, in, in the world or certainly North America. Um, uh, you know, I think that's a good example of, of trying to bring in 
uh, companies that that want to invest uh, and and bring their technology uh, closer to to the to the raw good. Um, finally, I would just say, you know, pretty simple. The the mouths to feed around the world are are growing. Uh, by 2030 alone, the world will have uh, you know close to nine billion people, which is you know around 825 million more than today, and and only four million of that growth um, will come from Canada. So you know the global opportunities uh, are just enormous, and and the largest growth expected is is in India and Nigeria, and, and neither of which are those are on Canada's. Uh, top 10 export destinations. So, you know, there, there's a significant amount of opportunity uh, for Canadian agriculture. Um, and I think we're doing a good job of it, but there's, you know, there's areas obviously that, um, you know, we can do, we can do better just like anyone or any country. That's a, you know, it's a good bridge to, you know, one of the, I guess one of the, the, the trends that everybody's reading about, uh, I, I would say COVID has brought it even, even more to light, which is, you know, eat local, uh, you know, 100 mile food, uh, shortened supply chains. How do we, how do we sort of hold that trend in juxtaposition to growing global population, global opportunity export market? Do, do those two things live well together in, in the space in Canada? Um, I, I can jump in on that one. I, I think, you know, the, the, the beauty of, of Canadian agriculture is, you know, it can be, uh, you know, there, there's opportunities and options for, for both of those things. I mean, I think by and large, um, you know, and Jessica, again, gave, gave a great point is, is there is, uh, um, uh, people have become accustomed to paying a certain amount for, for food um, and, and, and they want consistency. They, they want reliability uh, of the food. They, they uh, you know, the countries, uh, they, they want consistency of the Canadian product that, that we, can, we can provide. Uh, but having said that, I think there is also another segment of the population that that's willing uh, and able to do uh, or, or be more um, uh, expect a, a something different in, in what in what they're looking for. So whether that's a more premium product or a niche product or a product raised in a, in a different way, um, you know, I think that again, that's that's the beauty of what we can do here in Canada is is really the consumer dictates uh, what they want, and, and there's. There's an opportunity out there for for farmers um, across across the uh, spectrum to to provide just that. I think those things can absolutely coexist. Um, even just contrasting my own business with the direct to direct farm marketers that I've worked with, um, the consumer interest is there to buy from from those different systems, and it's and it's a huge opportunity um, for those of us that work in the sector as well. Um, you know, both Ryan and I have traveled around and, and met lots of farmers in our careers. And especially when I was working in the direct farm marketing space, it's very clear when you meet those people that there is a personality that is required if you are going to go and sell at a farmer's market every Saturday and not every farmer wants to do that. Um, but the great news is they don't all have to do that. Some farmers very much run their business in a business to business fashion. Other farmers, because of their interest, their personality, a whole host of reasons, choose to sell, you know, direct to, to consumer and may operate at a different scale because of that. And I think the diversification of, of consumer demands in itself is an opportunity because it allows diversification in the, in the supply chain. And I know, you know, for our own business, as an example, uh, we work with about two dozen Mennonite and Amish families to help us raise pigs. Most of them are in very small barns um, that generally speaking have sort of been left out of the more commodity style hog business over the past number of decades as things have evolved to be more efficient. Our processors, our truckers, they expect certain size barns, certain types of facilities. The, pro the, you know, the processing um, plants require certain numbers of pigs to come in at a time. They can't necessarily accommodate picking up 20 pigs here, 20 pigs here, 20 pigs here. But because we work in sort of a niche specialty space, it's allowed us to reach out and sort of recapture those people in a specialty industry who have been sort of left out of the commodity and it allows them to still have income for their family and still have an economic impact in their community. So absolutely, I think those different consumer segments can coexist and in fact, it creates a huge opportunity for those of us in the industry that we don't have to do things the same way. If we if we flip it around and look at challenges, we've surfaced some of them already. Um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. technology enablement being one of them, but some of the others that we sort of dug up as we as we did our work, 
aging population of farmers, something like a quarter of Canada's farmers will be over 65 relatively soon. Uh, need to accelerate a uh, culture of innovation, demographic imbalance where you know, women are underrepresented, indigenous are underrepresented in the sector. I, I, I'd like both of you to sort of weigh in as you, as you look forward in time, what are, what are some of the bigger challenges for the industry that we really, we really have to wrestle with and overcome? Ryan, why don't you start? Sure. Um, yeah, it, it, we, we actually um, recently did a RBC Thought Leadership Report uh, entitled Farmer 4.0, uh, how the coming skills revolution can transform agriculture. And I think, uh, you know, we did a, a pretty good job of addressing this in, in, in that report. Um, you know, the goal of that report was really to start a national dialogue on the opportunities that lie ahead and, and of course, the challenges that, that we're experiencing. Um, you know, certainly conversations like this uh, the one we're having today is, is another great step in the right direction to, to bring in awareness um, to, to the sector. Um, I encourage you all uh, to take a look for that report online. It's, it's free. It's uh, easy to find. Just, just Google RBC for, uh, Farmer 4.0. Um, so the, the report really uh, dives into the skills and labor uh, gap challenge. Um, as part of this you know, new skills agenda that we have, I think in its simplest form, we have we have an amazing opportunity as an industry to start talking to a larger audience about the amazing career opportunities that exist in agriculture. Um, you know, this is a vibrant high tech sector and, and becoming more of one. Students and workers have, have many avenues to succeed in this sector beyond what they might see as traditional farming roles, especially with the increased adoption of technology. Uh, you know, many old jobs seen as physically demanding are, are changing and this, this creates a um, a more attractive work environment for some. So uh, in this report, we outline there's, there's a demand for, for foundational skills, um, you know, across various industries, but in, you know, certainly in agriculture as well. So, you know, critical thinking and, and analysis and coordination and social perceptiveness, uh, active listening and problem solving. It's, it's important to understand that, you know, the industry also needs, uh, you know, human skills, not just job skills. And, um, you know, to illustrate the changing skills in the industry, our, our report, uh, clustered uh, agriculture roles into five different skills categories, uh, which will make up the future world of work. And, you know, very briefly, uh, you know, these five are what we call the deciders. And, and these are entrepreneurs and operators uh, who put that capital to work and, and de determine uh, which technologies to use. And, and as the name suggests, really drive the, the decision making on the farm. Uh, the next uh, cluster is what we call enablers. Uh, these are the engineers and installers uh, who help identify the next generation of technologies. Enablers represent the skill sets needed, um, you know, to bring in the new productivity enhancing technologies that we spoke about. Uh, engineers, electricians, uh, computer technicians, uh, and, and with their role is really helping make the farm more digitally enabled. Uh, the, the third cluster is what we call specialists. So these are scientists and technicians. Uh, who help transform those operations. So really those subject matter experts ensuring that the right tools and techniques and, and knowledge is, is being used. Um, so livestock managers or plant scientists, uh, regulatory experts. Uh, the fourth, uh, advisors, something uh, we know well. Uh, advisors are, are experienced consultants, uh, strategic thinkers, uh, you know, really the, the agronomists, um, you know, the financial advisors, the different types of consultants farmers work with um, that help uh, operators make those big decisions. And then finally, the last is, is what we call the doers. Um, and these are, you know, really the laborers who, who work with those machines and, and technologies, but, you know, face the most uh, automation risk. So, so when we break down these roles into these clusters, you can see there's, there's really a lot of opportunity beyond being the owner or the operator of the farm. Uh, more and more of those on the farm are relying on their network of uh, support to really drive their business. Um, you know, an egg is just a home for, for diverse thought and diverse backgrounds, uh, new ideas and approaches, and, and really you just need, you know, curiosity and, and commitment to learning, uh, which is important as anything. So we, you know, we really need passion and, and interest and can-do attitudes. So, so I think, you know, uh, to summarize, I think our biggest challenge um, is really getting, uh, you know, people to consider agriculture for, for a career and, and uh, getting more recent HBA uh, grads to, to aspire to work in, in the ag industry. Hey, Mazzy, we're going we're to turn this back to you in a second, but I, I do want to get Jessica's uh, point of view in, in before we do. 
just how do you look at challenges the industry's got to overcome, uh, say over the next few, uh, over the next few years? Absolutely, and, and and I absolutely agree with with Ryan on this. Um, for sure, hands down, the biggest challenge we have is attracting skilled, diverse workforce that we need. And he did a fabulous job of sort of outlining the different different categories, if you will, of, of workers that we need. Um, Mark, you correctly identified that agriculture has traditionally been a male dominated industry in the past. Um, that's not unique to agriculture. There are lots of male dominated industries out there where Ivy grads and women are, are carving out their, their space. So I don't think that's unique to us. And um, if you look at the, the progression of the ag census, census, whatever the plural of census is, over the last number of years, that is a trend that is on the, the upswing. We are seeing more female farm operators. So we are getting there and there's some great initiatives that are that are going on behind that. There's a group called the Egg Women's Network that is doing some really, really fabulous work to try and um, sort of push, push the boundaries and make egg a more welcoming space for women. Um, certainly the issues around diversity and inclusion um, that has sort of been mentioned in terms of workforce need to be more front and center. Um, and those discuss discussions and shifts I think are, are starting to happen um, perhaps later than they should have, but they definitely need to happen to make sure our, our industry stays relevant and can attract the talent that we need. For me, one of the fascinating sort of dichotomies about our industry and our ability to attract talent is that we as an industry for marketing purposes to sell our product have kind of created this folksy, idyllic, pastoral view of agriculture with overalls and red barns and old McDonald's farm, the thing that kids stories books are made of because it helps us sell our product. And it seems to be that consumers like that kind of story. So our marketers have latched onto that. But then when it comes to actually attracting people to our industry, if that's the image that they have in their mind, it does us an incredible disservice to try and get the people that we need. Uh, it doesn't show that we're professional entrepreneurs. Like farmers are professionals. Um, they do, they wear so many hats. We do so many different things. We have a very professional industry. I know people who have master's degrees in swine nutrition. I know two PhDs in dairy genetics. There are incredibly smart, well-educated people working in this industry. Um, but this sort of dichotomy of behind the scenes, we're incredibly professional but then we often give out this image of like folksy red barns. And unfortunately, I think it does us an incredible disservice when it comes to demonstrating the career opportunities that exist in our industry. Mr. Bossy agrees with you, according to the chat. <laughs> there you go. Maz Mazzy, back to you. Yeah, Jessica, can I follow up with that? I mean, what you're saying makes a lot of sense in terms of the barriers to at attracting Mm -hmm. um, a capable labor for securing the future of, 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 of the sector. Uh, one of which was this image that you uh, composed of um, what um, or who rather um, a farmer could be. But also there's, there's another myth that if I want to get involved in this industry, I need to have a million dollars before I can go buy a farm, right? So, so there's, there's that as well. What advice would you have for someone who wants to enter this sector and uh, maybe a, a recent graduate or someone who wants to uh, pivot to shift from the current career into, into, into this profession. What advice would you offer them? Uh, I think Brian sort of touched on this uh, uh, initial, uh, already in the previous question. My first piece of advice is just to start asking questions and start listening. I think there's so much of our, you know, it's no secret that um, that our industry is very um, sort of family oriented. Ryan used the word legacy a few minutes ago. There are stories, there are so many stories. I feel like our industry is based on stories and you can learn so much and find so many hidden opportunities if you're prepared to ask questions and listen to those stories and really listen. And there's, there's so many, um, there, there's so many opportunities. Ryan touched on them with sort of his, his five buckets. Um, and certainly, yes, if you had a million dollars, if I had a million dollars, I could pay off a good chunk of a farm that, um, that was just purchased. So certainly there are opportunities that are very capital intensive, but there are lots of incredibly rewarding um, careers in the field that don't require you to be an entrepreneur and don't require you to have a million dollars. 
even from a business perspective, you know, commodity trading is a hugely exciting business mm -hmm. for a business grad. Um, mm -hmm. There's all kinds of sales opportunities. There's all kinds of marketing opportunities, um, even just, you know, financial and, and all of the work that, that Ryan's teams will do. There's so many interesting opportunities um, if you are a business grad. And even if you want to be an entrepreneur and want to be a, a primary farmer, there are ways to do it that don't take a million dollars. Mm. Um, so there's some, there are some really neat programs out there that allow people to sort of start renting small, small parcels of land. Um, and that direct farm marketing sector that I talked about is often sort of a starting point for people to sort of enter the industry as well. So, you know, there's a huge range of opportunities if you don't want to be self-employed. And then even if you do want to be self-employed, there's lots of ways to get started uh, that don't require a million dollars but you need to start by asking questions and, and, and being open and listening to those stories. And any farmer you find or anyone who works in the industry is gonna be happy to tell those stories to you. Hmm. Uh, Ryan, um, if you allow me, I'm gonna ask a, a, a similar question, but maybe um, a slightly modified version of it. I get a sense that the dynamic, watching the dynamic between you and Jessica, I get a sense that there's a heck of a lot of collaboration that may happen in the industry. Um, which may suggest that the sector itself is actually far more collaborative than one may think. And that might make it much easier for someone to enter the sector if they don't have prior knowledge. So Jessica is, is offering the opportunity for people when they get in to ask a lot of questions. And my sense is that that may suggest that people are willing to aid. People who are uh, uh, farmers are willing to, um, to aid and collaborate and help. Is that, is that a fair conclusion I'm making? Yeah. <clears throat> Without question, um, and I think Jessica answered that the previous question perfectly. Um, it, the the place to start is, is by reaching out. Um, uh, farmers love talking about what they do um, because they're so passionate about it and they've dedicated their lives to it. Um, so you know, if you aren't from this farm community or or you didn't grow up on a farm, I, I think that you know there's there's still that opportunity for you. And I think that narrative really needs to change. Um, just because you didn't grow up in it doesn't mean it's not a, a, an industry that you can participate in. And, and, and again, Jessica, I think, you know, explained that you know, very, very well. Um, you know, as long as you can demonstrate you have, you have a willingness to learn, uh, you have a willingness to work hard. I mean, there's no gain around that. Far farming is about working hard. Um, that's just in, in the soul of, of the industry. Um, but if you can learn, um, you're on your way. And, and curiosity is, uh, is something that is invaluable as well. So, you know, reach out, talk to farmers, look for mentors. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in mentors. I, I, I have a couple still today. Um, some I've been, you know, I've been working with for a long time, others for a shorter period. Um, but mentorship is, is, a, is a big part of that. And, and, you know, everyone's willing to, to connect you with somebody else. And, hey, I think I know someone that you should talk to. Um, and, and truthfully, no one has all the answers. So I think there's sometimes a hesitation or, or there's a bit of um, you know, insecurity around that with you know, the confidence of going out and asking the questions or, or putting yourself out there. No one has all the answers. I spend all, all my time in this sector and there's so much I continue to learn um, from others and so much I, I still don't know. And it's just a fascinating industry that um, you know, really has, is, has a home for, for so many people beyond uh, you know, who, who grew up on the farm. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, Jessica and Ryan, so here's a, a question that is related to the topic, to the title of the conversation that we had. For those people, for those leaders who um, are interested in the sector, but not maybe not necessarily um, ready to um, step in and invest in the sector, what big lessons do you think they can draw from what's happening in the sector? So, so what's available for a leader who is, um, outside of the sector, uh, what, what key lessons do you think they can draw? Either of you could maybe tackle this one. Um, I can jump in, Jessica. If you Go ahead, Ryan. Sure. Um, I think some of the lessons that can be learned, and, and, and again, uh, Jessica said it earlier, you know, farmers are, are managers, they're entrepreneurs, they're, they're leaders, they're business people. Um, and there's a lot that other industries can learn from, from them. Uh, first, you know, know your business. Um, I think it's hard pressed to find another profession where, um, you know, it's hard to separate career and, and life. I mean, they, they know their business exceptionally well uh, because they have to. 
um, you know, know your, your strengths and weaknesses as, as a, as a business owner, um, you know, utilize advisors, uh, you can't do it all. And I think farmers have done a good job realizing that, especially as their operations have gone bigger and, and the need for specialization and support, um, you know, there's again, that idea that a farm has to be a jack of all trades and, and typically they, they are, but um, you know, you need to bring people in to support your business. And I think farmers have done a good job of that. Um, probably more than anything, be passionate and, and love what you do. Uh, farming is, is tough. Um, you know, you, you stay in farming because you're, you're willing to go through the ups and downs um, because you can't imagine doing anything else. And I think that's, a, you know, if every business owner and every person who worked in the industry took that same mindset, um, I think that'd be, you know, would, would serve them well. Um, and then, you know, be prepared for the battle uh, and not shy away from it. You're, you're going to fall in hard times, I think, sometimes in business. And, and sometimes that means adapting. Other times that means staying the course. Um, but I think, again, farmers and, and agriculture organizations really take that long-term mindset. Um, we live in a world today where I think short-term results are, are, are wanted and maybe demanded too much or expected. Uh, but farmers again, they have that more generational mindset and longer term mindset, which I think helps them make better decisions longer term. Um, and uh, I, I think, again, those, those ideas of how they um, you know, run their business and, and the approach they take, I think could really serve other industries well. Absolutely. I agree with, with all of Ryan's sentiments. I think for me, one of the things that, that's, that sticks out, I, the best term I can come up with is slim margin feistiness. I think I, I referred to earlier the fact that, you know, we have an entire industry where generally speaking on a percentage basis, we work on slim margins. It's the nature of our industry. And I think that creates a certain level of sort of hunger and feistiness that you can't ever sit idle because there could be um, an unforeseen thing happen, something breaks, um, an, an added expense here and there. It doesn't take much to tip the scales in a, in a given month or a year for something to, to no longer be profitable. And I think that creates this certain feistiness and, and just eagerness to, to stay on top of things. I think also it's an industry that's constantly has been reinventing itself. We've talked about how it's um, an incredibly old industry, obviously, since we're producing food, um, but it, it it's constantly changing, right? We have robots milking cows. Um, you know, last weekend, my mother-in-law planted barley in a tractor that used satellite technology to ensure that she stayed within one centimeter of where she was supposed to plant those seeds in that barley field. Um, so we're constantly reinventing ourselves. And I think that's a great um, lesson to be transferred elsewhere. Um, you know, the world doesn't stand still. Yes, we're still producing food. What we're producing hasn't changed, but how we do it who's doing it, the technologies that we use, those things have changed. Um, and I think the last thing that comes to mind, and this sort of relates to the, the unpredictability of, of, of the industry is just sort of this need to be brave. Um, there's a psychologist from Alberta who I really enjoy. And um, she uses this phrase, uh, a definition of brave that is doing something with your whole heart when you can't predict the outcome. And I think that's a mantra that's certainly true in much of agriculture, given the unpredictability of weather, the unpredictability of plant and livestock health, the unpredictability of markets or global trade or whatever it might be. Um, so I think it's, um, it's a mindset that I think we have to have in our industry by necessity, but it's a mindset that if adopted could um, serve other industries well as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, to me, this is really appealing. I mean, as it appears to be, as you mentioned, Jessica, um, a rather old uh, industry and oral practice, but it not only it exhibits many contemporary features of a successful sector, but it, all, it may actually be modeling some of the uh, future behaviors that we may want to mirror. Um, the ability to, um, uh, to be resilient and, and respond to constant changes, uh, innovation across the whole sector, and also this, this sense of collaboration within the sector itself. These are some uh, behaviors that many, many other sectors may actually want to figure out how to adopt. I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, Mark, um, I'll, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, if, if, only, we, if only we did produce some, some new food. My, my daughters have requested pink corn. If we could figure out pink corn, they would buy a lot more corn, or rather, I would buy a lot more pink corn for them. Uh, I think we should, I think we should try to get to uh, two of the questions that are in the 
in the Q&A that came in back to back exactly on the, on the sort of same topic. Uh, and it's about the idea of uh, urban sprawl, losing agricultural land to residential developments, whether it's condos or, or retail and whatnot. And is, is there sort of sufficient momentum with technology and innovation to make up for losing land? I, I guess the flip side of it is, do we just have so much land in Canada, it's not actually as big a deal as we think it is? I think the challenge there is that land is not land is not land is not land, right? So um, yeah, we have a lot of land in Canada. Um, there is a very, there's a lot of really, really good farmland under the greater Toronto area and the greater Golden Horseshoe area, unfortunately. Um, just sort of the nature of how history and, and settlement patterns take place is that people are gravitated initially to places where you have things like water and good land and can grow food. And unfortunately that's often where then settlements um, expand and then you end up um, losing out on some farmland. Um, to weigh on in on, on, you know, are we gonna keep pace enough to, to make up for it? Um, I'm not sure I would be brave enough to make a prediction on that one, maybe Ryan is. Um, but I think that that's one of the key things to recognize is that there are some very unique microclimates and, and pockets within Canada. So the ones that come to mind for me here in Ontario are places like the Niagara region and Niagara on the lake and the ability to grow grapes. And then the other huge one that comes to mind is the Holland Marsh. Um, so, you know, between Toronto and Barrie, a huge vegetable producer in this province with a very, very unique um, set of sort of conditions in terms of soil um, that can't be replaced. We can't make more of that if we decide to build a condo on top of it. So I think that's really a key thing to, to recognize is it's not just quantity of land, it's what type of land, what's the climate, where that land is um, and that type of thing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think, and, and to the bull prediction, I mean, I think that's something we're, we're all aspiring for and that's what you know drives everyone working each day in the sector um you know to do it, it, it is to meet that challenge of, of growing more and uh with less and and and, and again jessica's points spot on it's land isn't land isn't land and and i think um you know certainly if if there are uh you know some of that land is you know, that really viable unique uh, uh, land is being uh, used in, in, in non-farm purposes. I think that's something that really has to be given a lot of consideration before, before that's being done, because, um, you know, you, you can't just uh, pick up, uh, you know, something from, from that you're planting in one area and plant it uh, with the same amount of success somewhere else. So uh, a lot of consideration and thoughtful approach has to be done to that. Is there, uh, hey, Ryan, I know you got to scoot a few minutes early, so when you need to go, you, you, you go, and we, we will we will make sure to say only good things about you after you leave. Is is there a public policy angle on all this? Is there is there a role for for ag advocacy and, and policy to preserve some of the more the more valuable rich agricultural land? Uh, you know, I, I'm. I'm... It's something I, I'm not traveling as, as, as close to probably on a regular basis. I'm, I'm, you know, it's certainly, I think the messaging is, is appropriate. Um, you know, and I think that there's obviously a lot of uh, passionate people in the industry that, uh, you know, are experts in, in, in that area that are, 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 are speaking the right messages in that regard. Um, so, so I, I think, again, there's, there's, a, there's a home for that debate and, and there's, um, you know, a lot of uh, focus uh, on on that and, and on sustain sustainability in, in the sector um you know right now um but i think absolutely i mean the, the best thing and i think it's proven over and over again is the industry goes through a lot of a lot of debate a lot of different ideas a lot of different perspectives and and the only way to really meet those is with good dialogue and, and hearing different opinions and, and being able to uh as an industry come together and make make the best decisions for for those types of policies uh, going forward. And, and um, you know, I, I think we all uh, appreciate that opportunity to have those conversations. I know I'm, I'm not a land use planner, but I have spent some time in, in the provincial public service. And I know, with, you know, with land use planning policies that are in place, um, you know, efforts are, are being made. And, and certainly in Ontario, we have things like the Greenbelt area, 
where again, from a policy and advocacy perspective, efforts are being made to try and protect farmland. Um, it's not my area of expertise per se, but certainly there is a role for, for public policy. I think like anything, the challenges we're not just, you know, the only criteria is not what's the quality of this soil we're dealing with and balancing off the economic realities of this being a farm versus, you know, what's the tax revenue of this being a residential, commercial, condo development, whatever it might be. So there's a lot of different factors and I don't envy the people sitting in the shoes trying to, to weigh those different factors. We've got just, just a couple of minutes left uh, and, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Ryan, any, any um, sage advice or closing words from you before you go? Um, I would only say, you know, thanks for doing this. Um, you know, when, when you guys reached out uh, and, and you said you were going to be having a, a, a conversation on agriculture as, <clears throat> as a, a, a two-time alumni of, of Ivy, I, I was really pleased and really uh, honored to, to take part in the conversation today um, and, and appreciate, uh, you know, everyone that took the time uh, in their afternoon to, to join uh, the conversation um, and hopefully you walk away with um, some additional curiosity about the sector and you'll go and and uh, uh, continue to to research it um, you know certainly from from my perspective uh, I don't know if our information will be shared later but uh, you know if, if you if you ever want to reach out or or have a conversation I, I'm more than happy to do that it, it's it really is an important sector and uh, you know thanks again uh, for, for putting this on Ryan, thanks for saying yes. Nice to meet you. Uh, Jessica, I think we'll, we'll give final word to you and then Mazu and I will wrap it up. Sounds good. Yeah, I'd just like to echo Ryan's comments as well. Um, there's not a lot of, necess not necessarily a lot of people that come from a, fa a farming background uh, that end up in the walls of Ivy. So it's really exciting to have a conversation like this with alumni um, so that you can if you, if you don't know much about the industry, hopefully you've learned a little bit. And I think Ryan's report suggestion, the RBC report is a fabulous one to learn about the biz, more about the business of agriculture and especially that labor challenge. If you're more have a consumer hat on and just intrigued about production, I would encourage you to Google the real dirt on farming in Canada. There's a great publication that's done that talks about different production practices and what's grown and touches on a whole bunch of different um, issues at sort of a consumer level. So if you're coming at it more from a consumer curiosity perspective, The Real Dart on Farming is a great resource as well. Um, but certainly if you have any interest, please do reach out. Um, I think historically our industry has often been staffed and fueled by people who grew up on farms, um, but less than 2% of Canadians are farmers. So we can't continue to be a thriving, growing industry if all we have is Ryan's and Jessica's because there aren't very many of us um, to staff that 123,000 um, labor shortfall that we're expecting in the coming year. So, you know, it's a fabulous industry uh, to work in with so many different opportunities um, and would welcome any conversations. Um, always happy to, to chat more with people about, about what we do. Um, growing food is a really, um, a really great thing to do. You know, as a farm owner, there's really, really challenging days. There's days where we're trying to figure out how we're going to pay our bills sometimes. Um, and then there's really fabulous days where, where things are going well and you're reminded um, that the purpose of what you do is, is really noble and really important because you're feeding people around the world. Okay, excellent. We've, uh, as, as always, times are enemy. So a fair amount to do to wrap up here in, a, in, a, in about a minute. So Jessica and Ryan, first, thank yous to you. Uh, really, really appreciate the time, all the time you put into the, the preparation and today, great, great job. Wanted to acknowledge uh, Mark Vandenbosch, who taught here for a long time, was a dean here for a little bit, and is sort of our, our ag guy. And uh, he helped introduce us to the two of you. So uh, thanks to Mark if, if he's watching today. Uh, MR or Mr. Bossy corrected us, and he said, that's my dad. That's not me. I'm Mike Bossy. I'm just going to assume that's the Mike Bossy that scored 50 goals a year uh, on a regular basis that I grew up with my favorite hockey player. And... Um, uh, to, to the audience that joined us today, thanks so much for tuning in. Mazzy, uh, thanks for being the, the co-host today, and Tyler for jumping in in, in Sean's shoes. Uh, to everyone that joined us, we will see you uh, again next time. Cheers. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.